Father, we thank you for tonight, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here in your house, Lord, to come together to hear your word. Lord, I need your grace because I am inadequate to teach your word. But Lord, I thank you that it's not my words, but Lord, it's the word of the Holy Spirit. It's the word of God through your, your Bible, through your teaching that inspires us, that equips us, that motivates us, that leads us and guides us and directs us to be who and what you've called us to be in your church. And Lord, I thank you that we come into this place not to hear from a man, but to hear from you. And God, we ask that your Holy Spirit would lead us today in Jesus' mighty name. As we open up the Bible, Lord, I pray that you would help us to open our eyes, our ears, and our ears to see, hear, and understand your word, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. We thank you for all that you've done. We thank you all that you will continue to do in this place. We give you the glory and the praise in Jesus' name. We all said? Amen. Amen. Well, I thought tonight I would just share with what God had put on my heart a couple of weeks ago as I was reading through my Bible and just kind of putting some things. I thought I'd take you to a verse. And, and the, uh, the, 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 the message title today, and we'll kind, of, we'll kind of look at why it's that message title. The message title for this, this evening is called uh, um, Leavening Agents. Not leveling agents, leavening agents. Leavening agents. You know, have you ever noticed how easy it is to be influenced by outside sources? A couple of years ago, my wife and I, my, my wife is an avid Mexican food fan. I mean, I, don't t- I tell you, there is no greater food on the planet than Mexican food. Can I get an amen? amen? That was weak, man. I'm for the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. Y'all are weak. But anyways, my wife is an avid Mexican food fan, and my family knows that. And so I remember there was a time when uh, my parents, they were out on a vacation, and they went to this little tiny town in the middle of nowhere, two-hour drive from civilization. And they came back, and there's this, there's, this, there's this thing with my dad. And my dad is an influential person in our lives. And so there's this thing with my dad that kind of, it's this running joke, and if you're watching, Dad, we love you, and I, don't, I hope you don't stop. But uh, every time he eats somewhere new, he always comes back and just says, best food of my life ever had, true story. (laughs) So we were out one time with mom and dad, and we were in San Diego. We were driving home, and they said, listen, 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 listen. We just got to tell you, there is this little Mexican food restaurant in the middle of nowhere out in this town, in the country. You got to drive. It's off the beaten path, and it is by far, without a shadow of a doubt, the best Mexican food we have ever had True story. And I know that when he says true story, that means it's true. So my wife and I, we, we say, all right, let's try it out. So we get it on the map. We find it. We're driving. And it's this windy road. And Stacy, she gets so car sick. I mean, literally, if the car is driving on a straightaway, on a freeway, she is just so sick as can be at a curve into that road. And it's stories over. So we drive for two hours on this little windy road to this little podunk town in the middle of nowhere. And in the middle of this little tiny town in the middle of nowhere is this little tiny Mexican restaurant. And I'm like, man, I cannot wait. The food has got to be glorious for us to drive this far. I know that the Lord has anointed this food, right? Sure enough, we order what, we, what, we, what, what looks good on the menu. Ask the waiter, man, what's the best thing you got here, man? We're so excited. We eat the food, and wouldn't you know, it's terrible. I mean, absolutely awful, like competition with Del Taco at best. It's so easy to get influenced, to have influence or to be influenced by somebody. Think about in our lives, what, what are the things that influence us? We are influenced all day, every day, all throughout the course of our life by various things, things like political views, right? We have so much influence in our lives with political things and what people are saying, what we should do or we shouldn't do. We, we have spiritual influence, right? I mean, well, you know what? You believe your thing and I'll believe my thing or, well, your Bible actually says this and we're like, we really, it does? I didn't know that. And so we have all these different spiritual influences that come in our lives. How about academic or educational influences? Uh, how about societal influences? Things that tell us this is how your society or your culture should be. How about the influence of family and friends? How about the influence of co-workers? How about the influence of, of media? How about the influence of social media? How about the influence of things like Hollywood and movies? You see, there are all sorts of things all over the place, all day long, that seek to influence us. What is influence, if you even think about it? I mean, what is it to influence somebody? Well, simply put, I'll just give you Webster's Dictionary of that. Influence talks about the capacity to have an effort or effect of, on the character development or behavior on somebody or something. That's what influence is. The capacity to have an effect on something that changes the character or the behavior. 
And so for us, uncharacteristically, we would drive two hours for a Mexican food restaurant in the middle of nowhere. See, no, we know where they're all at, and they're all located right here in San Bernardino, Redlands, Colton area. Praise the Lord for our local Mexican food vendors. So we know, but the influence brought us to a place that was uncharacteristic for us. It changed everything about us. The influence of our political views, you might have had political views and then somebody argued or somebody influenced you or somebody spoke into your life or maybe you had a, a perspective on life and, and culture or society or media gave you a different picture and you begin to buy that picture of what life should look like, what success should look like, what finances should be like, what, what, a, what a happy marriage should look like based on a television sitcom or whatever it might be. You see, influence is the effect on the character or the behavior or the attributes or attitude of somebody else. And so we have... So many things in life that we allow to influence us, that allow to mold us and to model us into who we become, how we dress, how we think, how we speak, how we operate, how we act, all these different things influences something that is so important to our life. And you see, the Bible has so much to say about the subject and about the topic of influence, it's more so than we could even cover in just one night in, in, in 25 to 35 minutes of a message. So today I want to just take you to a verse that the God had set upon my heart as I was reading through. It's, it's, it's a series of parables. If you've got your Bibles, go with me to the book of Matthew in the 13th chapter. It's a series of parables that Jesus is speaking of and, and talking about the parable of the mustard tree and the parable of the wheat and the tares. And, and there he says one little sentence and I was reading through and I just read right through it. And then I came back and I thought, that's a really interesting statement. Come to find out as I started reading it, as I started reading different commentaries on it, I started reading to, to see what different people said. It's, it's actually a little bit of a rather controversial verse. Matthew, the 13th chapter, verse number 34 says it like, or verse number 33 says it like this. Another parable. So this is in a series of parables that Jesus was teaching what the kingdom of God is like. And so he talks about the kingdom of God is like a mustard tree that's planted and it grows to great to have great big limbs and the birds of the air rest upon it. The kingdom of, of God is like a, a wheat where the farmer goes and he sows wheat and then a, his enemy sows uh, weeds and, and you couldn't tell the wheats and the tares from each other. And he says, and then the kingdom of God is like leaven, which a woman took and hid three measures in, in three measures in meal until it was all leavened. And you see, I say this is a somewhat of a controversial, somewhat of a, a, a scripture where there's a lot of, I was just having a conversation with Pastor Deborah about this. I said, Mom, what'd you think about this verse? And she says, you know, I've, honestly, I've heard it taught both ways. And I say taught both ways. Why? Because oftentimes when you think of leaven, when, the, when you read about leaven in the Bible, leaven is not referred to as, as something that is positive. It's not referred to as something that is, that is good. It's not referred to as something, oftentimes leaven is equated with sin. And so here we see this verse, and, 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 and some scholars and some Bible scholars believe that this verse is, Jesus is talking about the influence of sin, but more, it seems more often than not, people begin to hold on to and hold on to the belief, and where I think Jesus is talking about is the kingdom of heaven, he says, is like leaven. What is leaven? Well, we can use leaven like uh, the idea of, and your Bible might even have an asterisk there in that word, that says yeast. It's a change agent. It's a leavening agent. It's something that causes dough to literally go through a chemical transformation and become something different. And so here he says the kingdom of God is this change agent. It's this leavening agent that a woman, she took a little bit of it and she hid it or she kneaded it into or she mixed it into three measures of bread until it was all leavened. Now, three measures of bread, the Bible, uh, the Bible commentaries and, and the different things and the weights and measurements of the Bible, three measures of bread is often considered to be three huge jugs of dough. So this is like about 50 pounds of dough that she mixed uh, leaven or yeast into, which would yield the servings for more than 100 people. So here he says, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pounds. So he says, it's like a little bit of something that you take it and you mix it into a big something and it changes everything. This little bit of leaven influences the entire chemical makeup of this entire batch of dough. And so Jesus is teaching in a parable and he's using this and the next verse goes on and it just says that Jesus uses these so that the scriptures would be fulfilled that he taught in parables. And so here Jesus is giving this example. And I think what Jesus is doing, I think that Jesus is pointing out the effective power that leaven has 
to bring change to something. When we talk about leaven, and when you see leaven in the Bible, it's so often referred to as the leaven of the Pharisees, or the leaven of the Sadducees, or the, the leaven, leaven of, the, of the Grecians, or, or the, the, the Gentiles, the, the leaven of sin, the leaven or the weight or the influence of outside things. As a matter of fact, speaking to the church, Paul the Apostle talks about to the church in Galatia, he says, listen, you guys were doing so well. Who stopped you from running your race? He says, man, what is going on? Who hindered you from obeying the truth? He says, this persuasion that you're living under, it doesn't come from God. And he he gives him this little statement and he says, wouldn't you know, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. A little bit of yeast will ferment the entire lump of dough. And so here, so often, almost exclusively in the Bible, we see leaven as a, as a reference to the weight or the outside influence of sin or the influence of the sin nature of man into our hearts. But I think that Jesus is, is painting a dichotomy, a, 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 a tension that it's two opposing ideas, two separate things. And he says, both of these things are incredibly influential in your life. And you and I have the decision on what will influence our life. You see, the leaven, if you want to look at it like this, leaven, when it comes to leaven in the Bible, leaven is a visual picture of influence. It's the visual picture or the metaphor or the illustration of the influence of the Pharisees or the influence of the Sadducees or the influence of the, of the Gentiles. It's the, it's the influence of the Herodians, he says. He says, watch out for the influence because you get a little bit into your life. You open your ears just a little bit and it will change the entire chemical compound of your life. You see, in this illustration, I believe that you and I, we are the dough. As a matter of fact, Paul the Apostle talks about it. He says, listen, man, you got to throw out the old leaven in your life and you got to be unleavened dough for God. you got to be untainted, unchanged, uncharacteristic to the things of the sin nature and to follow God. But Jesus uses the example like this, saying that leaven is the essence or the visual image of influence. The question then for you and I, according to what we're we're reading here in this parable is, are we going to be influenced by the leaven of sin or the leaven of heaven? That kind of rhymes, leaven of heaven, right? The good kind of leaven. You're like, I didn't even know there was good kind of leaven in the Bible. Leaven of sin or leaven of heaven? What is going to influence our lives? What are we allowing in? What are we walking? What are we operating in into the course of our lives? You see, because once leaven is added, you can't stop it. Once you put yeast into bread, you can't pull it out. It, it's, it's already starting to work. Once yeast and sugar combine, it starts burning. It starts eating. It starts fermenting. It starts a chemical reaction on the inside, and it changes the very chemical compound of whatever that agent is or whatever that dough is or whatever that sugar is or whatever it is. It, it's, it's something that once it's done, it cannot be undone. And so when you look at the leaven or the influence of heaven for what Jesus is saying, Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is like a little bit of leaven. And when you add it to your life, when you add it to your thoughts, when you add it to your finances, when you add it to your children, when you add it to your happiness, when you add it to everything in your life, you see, you add just a little bit to 50 pounds of dough and all of a sudden you start mixing it in you start getting it in you can't stop what's about to happen it's starting a chemical reaction it's starting to change all of a sudden things start to look a little bit different than they did before it was a lifeless little pile of flour and water but then all of a sudden something started to happen what you started to grow you started to rise you started to become something different you see we have a a choice in life. Are we going to be influenced by the leaven of sin, by the leaven of society, by the leaven of the world, by the leaven of our culture, by the leaven of pol- politics in the 21st century, by the leaven of media, or are we going to be influenced by the leaven of heaven, by the word and the, the truth and the precepts of God? Because Jesus says once you get it in, it starts doing something to you. So you can get the sin nature in you and it'll start doing something to you, or you can get the words of God, you can get the kingdom 
kingdom of heaven, and all of a sudden, something starts to change. You see, the dough would never change without leaven. It would just be dough. The, 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 the dichotomy, the, the tension here is that the woman had to take it and she had to mix it. She had to get it in there. And that leavening agent, that change agent that was added began to do something. And Jesus says, let that be my kingdom in your life. I think about it. My wife and I, we were at Disneyland a couple of weeks ago. And this is probably what actually caught my eye after I was reading this scripture. Is that we went to Disneyland a couple of weeks ago. And in Disneyland, California Adventure is the Budin, Bowden. Bowden, Budin, I don't know, bakery. Now, it's like the original sourdough bakery from San Francisco. And so I went back. I was real interested. I'm a geek. I'm a history buff. So, of course, I'm the guy at Disneyland that's not on the rides. I'm the one like me and mom are always at like great moments with Abraham Lincoln. And there I am. Everybody's wanting to get on a ride. And I'm like looking at all the different things about how do they make sourdough bread. I was raised on sourdough bread. Maybe it's just the Swedish part of me. Maybe it's just that, that European descendants or whatever it might be. But I was raised. My mama taught me to live and eat and appreciate a good sourdough bread. And so we were reading the story of this Boudin bakery in the 1800s. They, they brought over French sourdough bread, but it, it wasn't the same. And then all of a sudden, a 49er, a guy up in the hills of San Francisco mining for gold, brought this pot of dough he carried everywhere he went. And he gave them just a little bit of that dough, and they mixed that dough into their dough, and that dough changed their dough to become the sour bread dough that we know today as sour bread in America. Now, then that, what happened is they took that dough, and every day they would keep adding a little piece of that dough. They'd break that dough off, and they'd put it in that day's batch of dough, and they'd mix it. And they left the, they called it the mother dough, to sit to stew, to hold on to. And for 150 years, the Boudin Bakery has been pulling dough off of that mother dough to make sourdough bread. You know why? Because that dough is the leavening agent of their dough. So what they do is they take a little piece of the original every day and they break that off into the dough for the day. They knead it, they mix it in, and then they send it off to all the cool little machines to make the sour dough. You know why? Because that sour dough now becomes part of the original recipe. Jesus is like the mother dough for you and I. He's that leavening agent. His kingdom. He says, listen, listen, listen. He says, I got something for you. Now, I'm the, now, that's kind of weird theology, all right? So I'm not saying this, but he's kind of like, in, in terms of visual illustration, he's like, I'm the mother dough. We'll call him father dough because it's a little bit better like that. I'm the father dough to your life. You are dough. You are useless. You are lifeless. But he says, you break off a little piece of me. And you just... Start mixing it in your life. You start needing it. You start working it. All of a sudden, you start changing. Oxygen starts buzzing and fuzzing, and you start rising, getting bigger, getting tastier, and now all of a sudden you are San Francisco. <laughs> Sourdough bread. <laughs> Jesus is that change agent. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, he says. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven. You just add a little bit to your life. Everything will change. As a matter of fact, Paul was talking to the book of Ephesians. He was talking to the church and he says, listen, guys, y'all got to wake up. Don't walk like the, they walked in, on the earth. Don't walk like you used to walk. He says, he says it like this. He says, throw off your old sinful ways. Get rid of it. Which is corrupted by lust and deception. You see, you've been leavened by the world long enough. He says, get rid of it. Stop working it. Stop the chemical reaction that's going on on the inside of you. He says, get rid of it. Why? Instead, let the spirit break off a piece of that mother dough and start molding it, start kneading it, start mixing it into your life. Renew your thoughts and attitudes. And I love what he says it like this. And he says in verse number 24, he says, put on your new nature, your new nature, your new nature. How do you get a new nature? The leaven of heaven. The leaven of heaven. Why? You see, you can't get yourself a new nature. You've tried a new nature. You've tried self-help. You've tried the diet. You've tried the exercise plan. You've tried to be nice to that person you can't stand. And you could only do it for a day, if that. 
don't even want to talk about how long your diet lasted. <laughs> Put on the new nature. How do you get that new nature? Why? Because the kingdom of God is getting mixed on the inside of you. And it's not you. It's, it's, not, it's not your job. It's not your working. You see, the kingdom of God is in you. Jesus says, it's me on the inside of you. You've got me. I and you and you and me and we together. We're in the Father. And it's me and God and the Holy Spirit on the inside of you starting to change things. You got that bitterness. You got that anger that's been influencing your decisions. He says, I'm going to start working on that. I'm going to start oxygenating that. I'm going to start like yeast eating sugar. I'm going to start fermenting that. And I'm going to take those sour grapes of bitterness and I'm going to make them into something good, something sweet, something useful for the master's work. We put on the nature of God. Why? Not because we do it, not because we can, because the spirit of God, that mother dough has been broken off and has been mixed and kneaded on the inside of us and now we are something new, something unique, an image of the Father. So we have to choose what are you going to let influence you? The leaven of the world, the leaven of sin, the leaven of TV, the leaven of Netflix, the leaven of poli politics. Oh, Lord, help us. Or the leaven of heaven. See, how do we let the leaven of heaven influence our lives? How do we do what Paul says to put on the new nature of our lives? I just want to give you a real simple, easy thought. Why? Because I just want you to grab a hold of it because I believe it's the foundation for the leavening agent in your life. And that's this, to build your life on the foundation of the word of God. Because what you allow to influence you is what will make you who you are. You see, the Bible says that it was a woman. I, I think that we can, we can get real deep on, 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 on what the Bible says. The Bible says a woman. Peter says that the woman is... Now, girls, I didn't say this. Peter said this. You don't get mad at me. Get mad at Peter, okay? <laughs> Peter says the woman is the weaker vessel. I think the weaker vessel also shows the woman that we are the bride of Christ. This is the, the weaker vessel coming and taking this dough and kneading it. He says the, the woman, the, the, the bride, the, the, the vessel, this broken vessel takes it and he needs this, she needs this leaven into this dough, into this malleable, to this formable uh, product and she has to mix it in. You and I, we have the responsibility to take the leaven, to take the influence, to take the, 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 the word of God and to mix it into our lives. You see, it's there. It's there for you right now. It's there for you when you need it. It's there for you when, you when you don't know what to do. It's always there, but we have the responsibility in our lives to take the word of God and to mix it and to knead it and to beat it into our life and to mash it up and to take all the area. Now listen, all the areas. She, she took 51 pounds of flour and took a little bit. Of, she didn't take one vessel. She took three vessels. Why? What we like to do, we like to take a little bit of the leaven and we'd like to put it to a little bit of the dough. But there's still a lot of dough that needs to get the leaven in it. See, the Bible tells us faith comes by hearing, hearing by the words of God. And so you see, it's our responsibility to get the word of God. Paul says, man, how are they going to do what God wants them to do if they haven't heard? How are they going to hear if they haven't been taught? How are they going to be taught if they haven't been sent? You see, we have a responsibility to hear the words of God and to act upon these words of God. God's grace comes and he says, I'm going to give you some leaven. I'm going to give you some influence. I'm going to start doing something in your life. But you've got a human responsibility to act upon my grace and to follow and to do what I'm telling telling you to do. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You see, we can't even please God without his own words. Just like that, that, that San Francisco sourdough, it'll never be the original San Francisco sourdough. You can go and buy a sourdough starter kit at the store. But did you know that is not the San Francisco sourdough from 1850 that is, that is the original mother dough. That was somebody's little concoction in their little garage factory that they started selling. It ain't the real thing. You see, we've got to take the thing. We've got to take the real thing, the word of God. And we've got to mash it, mix it, apply it, live it, operate in it, not just read it. Not just hear the preacher tell us about it. We got to live the word of God. You see, she had to knead that dough. Not just sprinkle the yeast on there. She had to mix it in there. There's a responsibility on our part to mix the word of God into our lives. You know, I talked, about, I talked about a message actually about a year ago, July of 2015. I talked about a message about influential people. 
And I said a statement I believe with all of my heart. The statement I said was, what you allow to influence you will eventually, will eventually influence others through you. What you allow to influence you will, will influence others through you. The what you allow to influence the way you speak will start influencing others because you'll start speaking like that. What you allow to influence the way you think will start influencing others in your life because you'll start thinking like that. What you influence the way, what you allow to influence the way you act will start to influence others in the way that you act because they'll start doing what you do. A couple of weeks ago, we were sitting and driving in traffic, I think, we were on our way to church, and my little three-year-old daughter, she saw something outside and she said these words. She said, now, don't judge me. I'm trying to be transparent. She said, are you freaking kidding me? And I thought, I remember I said that statement a long time ago. What you allow to influence you will influence others. See, you see, my wife allowed somebody to influence her. And she says, are you freaking kidding me? I should have preached this when you were in New York. She heard her dad say that. And because I said that, now she started saying, now I had to sit down with my three-year-old daughter and tell her why she could not say the word freaking. And she's like, but daddy, you said it. <sighs> what you allow to influence you will influence others through you. So if you allow the leaven of the world, the leaven of sin to influence you, guess what? You'll start to influence the world around you with the leaven of sin and the leaven of the world. We see the beautiful part about the other side of that coin, the dichotomy, the other end of that spectrum, the, the other end of that teeter-totter. You start letting the influence of heaven, the leaven of heaven, to start influencing you. Guess what? It's going to start influencing others around you. They're going to start looking at you saying, what's going on with your life? I'm noticing a change. You look a little bit different. Did you have some work done? Yes, I did have some work done. His name is Jesus Christ, and he's been working on my life. What you allow to influence you will influence others through you. You are a leavening agent to the world, whether it be for sin or whether it be for the kingdom of God. And you and I have got to get that mother done. Now, Jesus says it like this in Matthew, the seventh chapter, a very familiar section of scripture. Jesus says it like this. He says, whoever hears these sayings of mine, but look what he says, and does them. Whoever hears these sayings of mine, and does them. Not just whoever hears these sayings of mine. Pastor Luke, I heard these sayings of Jesus. Amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord. I listen to that preacher on the TV. Oh man, he's so good. He's so encouraging. I listen to him every week, every Sunday morning at seven o'clock in the morning. I listen and I hear the words of Jesus. That's great. Jesus says, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a man who built his house upon the rock. I like that. And the wind came, came and the waves came and they beat vehemently, I love that, against his house. But it did not fall because it was founded on the rock. Now, I don't have the next section of Scripture on the overheads for you, but Jesus gives a contrasting statement to that. When you allow the, the, the leaven of the world, he says, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, so that guy's going to be like a dude that built his, hand on, built his house on the seashore and his house got washed away the first tide. Now that was my paraphrase. You see, we have the responsibility to take that and to knead it into our lives, to mix it, to take the word of God to let our lives be founded on the words of God. Why? Because we, we allow, I'll just tell you from my own life, man, I allow so many different areas to influence me. So many different cultural things to influence me. So many different, what's hot right now? What's trending right now? What's going on over here? Or the latest movie over here? Or the latest person over here? Whatever. We allow so many things to tell us, you ought to raise your kids like this. You ought to not say this. You ought to start talking like this. You ought to start doing like this. You're not successful until you start looking like this or until you live on this side of the town or on that side of the tracks or until you start driving that car. We allow so many things to influence us 
so that we look across the railroad tracks, we look across the freeway, we look at the TV, we look at social media, we look at the guy across the aisle on the other side at the desk, we look at the other person around us and say, man, I need to get like that. But God says, stop letting outside things influence you. He says, take these sayings of mine and build your life upon them. Whoever hears these things and does them. You see, the Word of God is the answer to life. It's not God didn't just send Jesus to give us some good advice. God didn't just send Jesus to preach some good thoughts. Well, you know what? If you listen to the words of Jesus, you'll feel really good about yourself. You know, actually, if you listen to the words of Jesus, you're probably not going to feel really good about yourself. Why? Because you're going to realize how much you need him. But you see, the Bible says that the word, the word, the, 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 the logos, the, the rhema became flesh and dwelt among us. You see, God didn't just send somebody to speak some wisdom into our life. Jesus said, the words that I speak, they're not of my own. The words that I speak are of my Father. They are spirit and they are life. John 6, 63, Jesus says that. You see, because when we take the words of God, they're not just something that we should allow to do something for our lives. You see, they should be the foundation of everything that we live on. I can't tell you how many times I've talked with people going through crisis or going through hardships or going through trouble in their life or in their marriage or with their kids or whatever it might be. We'll say, you know, the Bible says, and I'll start giving them a scripture and they'll finish it. You see, we know the scriptures. You can, you can Google any scripture and find it in five seconds. Jesus said this about what? What does the Bible say about this? And find all sorts of different scriptures and we can hear them and we can see them and we can read them. But Jesus said, he who hears these sayings of mine and does them. He who takes the leaven and doesn't just leave it on the table, but he who takes the leaven and mixes it into their life and starts adding, and starts walking, and starts living, and starts operating what I say to do, my words that are spirit and life, all of a sudden, that leaven will start to do something in them, and the problems, the trials, the hardships, the, the, the things that we face that seemed impossible, Jesus says, it'll start to change. Why? Because the kingdom of God is like leaven that a woman took, and she hid it into three measures of dough, and until it was all leavened, once it starts in your life and you start mixing it, it's going to do something. But I believe that there are far too many people in church today that hear the word of God, but they've never taken the step to mix it into their lives. And that's where we have got to look and say, what am I listening to? What is influencing me in my life? Is it the kingdom of heaven? Or is that just what it looks like? On paper, well, yeah, of course, on paper I go to church once a year. On paper I go to church once a month. On paper I go to church, but then I fall asleep there, whatever it might be. Or are we taking the words of God on a regular basis and putting value upon them? Not just so that we can recite them. Not just so that we can quote them. Not just so that we can, you know, tell somebody else what the Bible says when they need it. So that we can live them. So that we can walk in them. So that we can do them. So that we can build the foundation of our lives upon the rock of Jesus Christ and His words. Why? Because the wind and the waves are going to come our way. And Jesus says, you'll be like the man who built your house upon the rock when you build your life upon my words to mix that leaven, to mix that agent into our life and allow God to do some change. The psalmist in 1 Psalms 119, verse 11, the psalmist said it like this. He said, your word, your word I have hidden in my heart. Why? Why did he do that? So that I might not sin against you. That I might walk right, righteous and upright in your eyes. You see, we can't just take the leaven of God and leave it on the table and expect it to do something. We've got to take the leaven of the kingdom of God and mix it into our lives and allow it to permeate not just one measure, not just two measures, but all measures of our life. Our finances, our children, our happiness, our jobs, our fulfillment, our relationships, every area, the secret areas of our life that we say, God, I don't want you to touch. we got to say, God, come and sprinkle your leaven on this area of my life because I need you and I'll start kneading it and I'll start mixing it and I'll start moving it around and I'll let you start doing something in my life because God does not want you to stay the same. 
He does not want you to be who you are or who you were yesterday or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. You see, it's never too late in your life and it's never too early to start mixing in the leaven of heaven. You say, well, I've wasted most of my life mixing in the leaven of earth. Take what Paul said and throw the dough out and start afresh and break off a piece of that father dough, we'll call it, and start mixing it into your life and start putting on the new creation, the new creature. I don't feel new, neither do I, but the Spirit of God is moving on the inside of me, working in areas that I cannot see, but He's moving and He's changing and things are growing and things are molding and things are morphing into who God wants me and you to be. It's never too late to start. But take that word of God and build your life upon the foundations of the word who hears these sayings of mine and does them. And as we finish today thinking about this influential aspect of life and what influences your life, listen, don't get discouraged when you start looking around and say, well, their leaven is rising a little bit quicker than mine. Well, I'm looking at their dough and I remember we got, we got, We got saved at the same time, and their dough seems to change a little bit faster than my dough. If you've ever looked at the fermentation process, and that's the process of leaven or yeast or leavening agent combined with sugars, some things ferment quickly, and some things take years. So your fermentation, your leavening, the, the Spirit of God working on the inside of you might happen instantly. It might happen in a day. It might happen in a week. It might happen in a month. It might happen in a year. It might happen in a decade. Do not compare your leavening. Do not compare your fermentation. Do not compare your life to somebody else's dough. Why? Because if you've got a piece of that father dough on the inside of you, you are like Jesus Christ, changed from the inside out. The Bible says in Galatians, it says, listen, don't compare yourself. Don't look to the left or to the right. It says, don't boast in every, other people's works. He says it like this in Galatians, the sixth chapter, verse number four. Let each examine his own work. Look to your own dough. Why? Because Jesus, when you start mixing him in there, he's going to start changing it. You may not see it happening on the pace and on the, on, the, on the path and on the timing that you want it to happen, but it's on the timing that God wants it to happen. And God's got a plan. God's got a purpose. And he said, the kingdom of heaven is like leaven that a woman took and she mixed it in. He says, you start mixing it in there and it's going to happen. Why? Because once it starts, it can't stop. Once you get into Jesus, man, you can't walk away. Why? Because when you really get him, well, Pastor Luke, I've tried the Jesus thing. That means you put the leaven on the table. You got to take the leaven off the table and put it into the dough. Well, Pastor Luke, I put the leaven into the dough. You got to mix it into the dough. And you start mixing it into the dough and all of a sudden something's going to happen. Because God's going to do something in your life. God's going to bring about that change, that chemical reaction. He's going to do something to bring you to the place that he wants you to be. Why? Because Jesus Christ said the kingdom of heaven is a leavening agent. You've got the choice, the dichotomy, the the tension in the Bible. Will you allow the leaven of the sin, the nature of this world, or will you listen or get the leaven of heaven into your life? Jesus says, take these sayings of mine and do them. Mix them into your life and you will begin to see the leaven doing its work in your dough. And you will, like boudin sourdough bread, you will be a part of the original formula. Generations old. Why? Because you've got the dough, the leavening agent of Jesus Christ alive and at work on the inside of you. Don't give up. Don't stop. He's going. He's working. He's changing. You just trust him. Take his words. Build on them. Do them. Hide them in your heart like the psalmist says that you might not sin against God and watch your life begin to change. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you. We just thank you for the spirit of God. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would minister today. Lord, areas of our lives, I pray that you would open up our eyes. Lord, a hard question and a hard request. Lord, I pray that you would open up our eyes to the areas of leaven that we allow to influence us. And God, may we allow the leaven, the kingdom, the gospel of Jesus Christ to be the leaven that influences our lives. Lord, that we don't build our lives upon political foundations. Lord, we don't build our lives on cultural foundations. Lord, we don't build our lives on racial foundations. Lord, but we build our lives built built and based upon the kingdom of God and the leaven of God. And Lord, I pray that as your Holy Spirit begins to permeate on the inside of us, Lord, I thank you that you would begin to reveal that change, reveal that destiny, reveal that purpose to each and every person in this place tonight. As we walk out of this place, Lord, may we be led 
leavened by heaven in this place. In Jesus' mighty name. We all together said, amen. amen. Did you guys get something out of the word of God today? Amen. Praise God. Well, before we leave, I want to just do one, one thing real quick. I'll let you out in just a couple of minutes. I just want to give you the opportunity to examine yourself. The Bible says we just read it there in Galatians. Hey, church isn't out. We'll let you out in just a minute. Don't get up. Don't leave. All right, come on. Get leavened by Jesus. Y'all got to get leavened by Jesus. We just saw it in Galatians. Examine his own word. The Bible says that a man ought to examine himself from time to time. So I want to ask you a question. I want you to just think about it for a moment. Nobody will know the answer except you and God. Not your wife, not your best friend, not your confidant, you and God. The question is this, if you were to leave this place tonight and you were to die, heaven forbid that be the case, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? It's a simple question, but you see how you arrive at your conclusion has a lot to say about your position with God. You see, life is a fragile thing. We've learned that. We've seen that. All of us have seen somebody taken before their time. We're all one accident, one incident, or one epidemic away from our eternal destiny. And the question, if you were to examine your life today, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell, has a great indication of where you stand with God. And so often what I hear when I talk to people is they say, you know what, I hope I'm going to go to heaven. Man, I really want to. I wish so. Did you know that nowhere in the Word of God does it say that you can hope, that you can think, that you can want, that you can wish, that you're going to get to heaven, and that means that everything's good between you and God? Well, I've heard people say, well, Pastor Luke, you know, my parents told me growing up that I was a Christian, I was baptized or christened as a baby. I went to catechism classes. I went to Sunday school classes. You know, when the census came knocking on my door a couple of years ago, I marked off Christian in, my, in that category of religious beliefs. I've always called myself a Christian. My parents have told me all my life that I was a Christian. I've got a cross or a crucifix around my neck or a, an image in my house. I've even got a tattoo that makes reference to God. Doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? But did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because your parents told you growing up that you were a Christian? Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you were baptized or christened as a baby? Nowhere does it say that because you, uh, because you, you, you have the title or because you've got a cross or a crucifix or you attend church on a somewhat regular basis? Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that those are the things that get you into heaven? Like God's taking your GPS attendance or your, uh, your attendance at, uh, in life and if you attend church so many times you get into heaven? You cannot find that in the Word of God. Well, but, but Pastor Luke, I'm a, I'm a good person. You know, I don't cheat on my taxes. I, don't, I, don't, I try to give to charitable organizations. I, I try not to do wrong. I do more good in my life than I do bad. And good people, I've always been told, go to heaven. Did you know that nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you're good, because you don't cheat on your taxes, because you give to charitable organizations, try to help your fellow brother around the world? Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that that means that you're going to get into heaven? You see, the Bible tells us that our good deeds, according to God's righteousness, are like filthy rags. Nothing you and I could ever do on our own would ever make us good enough to get into heaven. Well, you know, but I'm a spiritual person. I believe that there's powers at work that are far beyond me and that I just can't seem to comprehend what they are. And you know, you find heaven your way, I'll find heaven my way, and we'll all kind of get there the same, the same place with just different names. Did you know the Bible does, doesn't say that all roads lead to heaven, that if you, if you have a spiritual awareness or if you try to keep an open mind and not try to close it off, that you're going to find your own way. You know, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says it like this. Jesus says this. Jesus says that he is the way the truth and the life. He says that no one, listen, no one goes to the Father except through Him. You see, there's no other way except through Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, Jesus was having a conversation by, with a man by the name of Nicodemus. You can read it for yourself in John the third chapter. Nicodemus was a religious leader. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. So that means that he was educated. He, he was a position of title and authority. He, he knew the scriptures. He did all the right things, said all the right things. And as Jesus has this conversation with Nicodemus, Nicodemus asks him, what, am I, what must I do to get into heaven? You would think with a man like Nicodemus, Jesus would pat him on the back and say, man, you just keep doing what you're doing. Keep on the path that you're headed. Everything's good. But Jesus says these words to Nicodemus. He says to Nicodemus, in order to see the kingdom of God, you must be born again. You see, what does that mean, born again? Nicodemus asks, what does that mean? I got I to gotta go back into my mother's room and come back out again. Jesus says, listen, what is born of the flesh is flesh, but what is born of the spirit is spirit. And born again has meant the same thing from the eyes and the heart of God, from the beginning of God's word to the end of God's word means this, it means that you've given all of your heart, you've given all of your life to Jesus Christ, to God the Father through His Son, Jesus Christ. It's not what Hollywood's made it out to be, it's not what culture's made it out to be. You've listened too much to the influences of the world. Now it's time to allow the leaven of heaven to tell you what it really means. Jesus says it like this in the book of Revelation. He says, I'd rather find that you're hot. He says, I'd rather find that you're cold. If I find that you're lukewarm, he says, I will vomit you. Oh my gosh. He says, I will vomit you from my mouth. A shocking statement out of the mouth of Jesus. 
You see, Jesus is speaking to his church, people like you and I. He says, listen, you think that you're doing everything good. You think that you look good. You think that you've got the right clothes on. You, you think that you're, you're, you're covered in splendor. But he says, you don't realize how naked and how destitute you are. He says, oh, I wish that you would come to me and buy gold and silver refined for me. He says, I wish that you would stop trying to do things on your own. Because you'll never work hard enough. You'll never earn it. You'll never deserve it. You can never buy your way into heaven. You can't go to church enough times. You, you can't pray enough prayers. You can't wear enough crosses around your neck. You can't have enough tattoos. And you can't think enough good thoughts to get into heaven. He says, oh, I wish you'd stop trying to do it your way. And I wish you'd come to me and do it my way. And what is that way? Jesus says it like this. He says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. He says, he who opens the door, I'll come in and I will dine with him and he will dine with me and we will be together. You see, Jesus says, I'm knocking on the door of your heart and it takes you opening that door and inviting me in, surrendering your life, your will, your way to my ways, to my will. Jesus says it like this. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He says that no one goes to the Father except through me. He says, today I'm, I'm opening up the door. I believe that there are people right now that the Spirit of God is knocking on your heart, saying, listen, you've done it enough your way. You've been influenced by the things of the world enough, and you've never found the answers that you've been looking for. And I believe right now that the Spirit of God is knocking on the door of your heart, saying, are you going to come home? Are you going to respond? In just a moment, we're going to pray a prayer of salvation. We're going to ask Jesus to come and be the Lord and Savior of our life. And I want to include you in that prayer. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to do something real bold. I'm going to count to three. And in a moment, I'll go like this. I'll go one, two, and on the count of three, I'll go three. And I'll smack my hands together real loud. Bang, just like that. I'm going to ask you to do something real bold. I'm going to ask you to pop your hand up. You see, what you're doing by the raising of your hand is saying, you know what, Pastor Luke, I want to be a part of that. Pastor Luke, what you're talking about today, man, I, I, that was me. I thought, I thought that everything was okay with me, but you know, I just feel that the Spirit of God speaking to me right now. And I want to respond. I want to give my heart. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. Ah, you say, I don't know if I could do that. Jesus says it like this. If you confess him before men, he'll confess you before his father. But if you deny him, he said, I'll deny you before my father. Listen, church, I'm a man. I'll see your hand. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down and we'll go forward together from there. It starts today by making that decision, the decision to follow Jesus. That decision to give your heart, to give your life to Jesus Christ. You see, what you're doing is you're saying, I want to open the door of my heart to Jesus Christ today. We'll pray that prayer together in just a few moments. We'll go forward from there. But it starts today by making that decision. Who should raise your hands if you've never given your heart? You've never given your life to Jesus Christ. If that's you in just a moment, get ready. Pop your hand up. If you're not sure, listen, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit on the inside of you is God's seal of approval on you. God's desire is not for you to walk around life hoping and wanting and, and wishing and desiring. Man, I hope so. God says, I've given you the Holy Spirit on the inside of you so that you would know so. Do not walk out of this place tonight without making sure that you are in the right place with God. Tomorrow is not promised. All you have is right now. So let's make the best of what we have. If you've been living lukewarm, what does that mean, lukewarm? Lukewarm simply means this. It means that you've got your ups and your downs and your ins and your outs and your occasional church attendance, token prayer doing some of your own thing, doing some of God's thing, kind of in and out with Jesus Christ, in and out with church. Listen, if that's you, I love you enough and respect you enough to, to tell you the truth today. Based on the word of God, you're not going to make it. But that doesn't have to be your eternal destiny. Why? Because the spirit of God is knocking on your heart right now saying, come on, it's time to respond. It's time to come home. It's time to choose life. Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus says the thief doesn't come except to steal, kill, and destroy. He says, but I... I have come that you would have life and that you would have it more abundantly. He says, it's not even so much about what happens when you die. That's great. We need to have that addressed. But it's also life here on earth. And it starts today by accepting Jesus Christ into your heart, into your life. So in just a moment, I'm going to count to three. If that's you in this place, when I do, you pop your hand up, I'll see it, I'll acknowledge it, and put it right back down, and we'll go forward together from there. Real simple, real easy, all over this place. This is your moment. This is your time. Listen, you've had doctors and dentist appointments now. It's a divine appointment between you and God. Don't let anything distract you. Don't let anything influence you except for the Spirit of God speaking to you right now. It's time to respond to the invitation of Jesus Christ to come home, to be a part of the family of God. Today is the day of your salvation. I'm going to count to three. If that's you in this place, all over this auditorium, front to back, side to side, wherever you're at, you guys in the family rooms, I can see you through the windows, wherever you're at. If that's you in this place, you pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it and put it right back down. And we'll go forward together from there. You ready? Here we go. I'm going to count to three. Now it's your turn. Ready? One, 
two, three. Let me see your hands in this place today. If that's you in this place, one, two, three. I see you right over there. Three wise people. Anybody else? Anybody else? I see you guys. I saw those hands over here. Anybody else? You say, four, I got you right there, sister. You say, man, I wonder if that's me. The Spirit of God speaking to you saying, yep, it's time for you to come home. It's time for you to respond. It's time for you to open up the door of your heart and allow Jesus to start doing his work on your life. Anybody else in this place? I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. Anybody else in this place today? We're going to conclude. We're going to wrap it up. I don't want to miss you. All right, well, let's give the Lord a great big praise for four wise people. That's great. Well, here's what we're going to do. I said we're going to pray a prayer. So all four of you that raise your hand, maybe number five, number six, number seven, you didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have. You say, ah, I wonder if that was me. Here's what we're going to do. We're all going to stand together in a moment. My buddy Joe's going to sing a song. As we do, I want you to grab a coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible, a friend if you need a friend. Why don't you get out of your seat, get out of your chair, and come and meet me up here at this altar. We're going to change destinies together right here, right now. So let's all stand together. If that's you in this place, if you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, come on, come meet me right here, right now. Let's change destinies together. This is your moment. Come on. You come, come on if that's you. Well, hey, you guys came. You know what? Maybe you made some bad decisions in your life. Maybe nobody's even ever told you, but I, got, I want to be the first person today to tell you, good job. Good job. You know you're making the right choice today. You're making the very best decision you possibly can make as a human. I mean, that's huge. Good job. Here's what I want to do. I said we'd pray together. See, this, see this, my friend over here waving at you? This guy's name is Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel's a really cool guy. Here's what he's going to do. He's going to take you guys right over there. He's going to pray with you. Listen, it's not an abracadabra magical formula, all right? God listens to the prayers of your heart. So you're inviting Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior. Lord and Savior? What does that mean, Lord and Savior? You're inviting him to be the leader of your life. Say, come on, have your work. Do your way. Come and make me and mold me who you want me to be. Surrendering your life to Jesus Christ. Second thing he's going to do is he's going to give you some free information. Some real easy to read literature. says, you know what? You walk out of here and say, what do I do next? We're going to point you in the right direction. Third thing he's going to do is he's going to invite you to come back. We want to connect you with somebody here at the church personally. One-on-one connection. You know you go to the gym, you get a personal trainer. Somebody that helps you and make sure you're working all that hard to figure out equipment the right way. We, have, we call them spiritual personal trainers. They're, they're somebody that will come alongside of you. Teach you some things about the Word of God for just a couple of weeks. You're not joining some big, long program, but they're teaching you some things about the Word of God for a couple of weeks to get you strong in the ways of God so that you don't go back to your life, but you go forward. Go back to the life that you're walking away from, but you go forward in everything that Jesus Christ has for you and your future with Jesus. So if you guys just turn to your left, my right, go right over there with my buddy, Pastor Joel.